Tonight, we are unpacking the stunning news that the FBI searched the Florida residence of the ex-president to investigate crimes associated with possible violations to the Espionage Act. Agents who conducted the search recovered several sets of very sensitive, highly classified government documents. This comes at the end of a busy week for both the January 6th committee investigating the insurrection and Congress, which just passed a hugely consequential piece of legislation. Congressman Jamie Raskin sits on the January 6th committee and served as the lead House manager for the second impeachment of Donald Trump. And he joins me now. Congressman, I want to get to this breaking news about the search warrant. Can I get your top line reactions to the news that the documents seized from Trump's Florida home related to possible violations of the Espionage Act? Well, uh, thank you for having me. I should say from the beginning that I know nothing more about that than you know or any of us know just from you know, reading the papers and watching the news. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I thought from the beginning of the Trump administration that this was a guy who was far more loyal to his um, fellow kleptocrats and autocrats around the world, people like Putin and Orban and El Sisi than he was to the people of the United States. So, um, you know, some strange words have entered our political lexicon recently, like uh, coup and insurrection. And now espionage is right there with them. And uh, it's pretty shocking and it's pretty horrific, but it's hard to say it's surprising at this point. Indeed. The ex-president trying to claim he declassified these top secret documents before he left office. We've already had other guests who said that's not even relevant to this conversation. What do you say? Um, yeah, I haven't studied the legalities of that, um, but I, I do notice a, a, a dramatic shift in tone among the Republicans who were uh, shouting about civil war and this being the worst invasion of civil liberties and all of that nonsense. I mean, this went through an independent neutral magistrate who issued the warrant based upon probable cause. Um, and these are very serious offenses. No president or former president has come anywhere near Donald Trump in terms of, uh, you know, allegedly committing these offenses. It's an astonishing thing um, that we're at this point. Um, I hope that uh, the Republican Party will start listening to Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. But right now, uh, his stranglehold over the Republicans continues. And, you know, they're acting like a, a spellbound uh, cult membership. I mean, here's the thing. They're not just defending him. They're also lobbying attacks at the FBI, at DOJ, ahead of yesterday's attack on the Cincinnati field office. I mean, have you heard... Any of your Republican colleagues try to tone down the rhetoric? I mean, are they worried that they could be inspiring this kind of attack? Well, the leadership seems to be holding their fire a little bit since um, mm -hmm. this evidence has come out. But generally, no, they're still in the same place. And you're right. I mean, they called themselves uh, the pro-police, pro-law enforcement uh, party until uh, their mob attacked um, hundreds and hundreds of our police officers and wounded and injured 150 of them with traumatic brain injury and broken jaws and necks and all of these gruesome uh, wounds that they suffered. And they just let that go. And now uh, the people who were fictionalizing that somehow the other side was talking about defunding the police. Now they're talking about defunding the FBI. They're talking about defunding law enforcement. Um, because all that matters to them uh, is their Lord autocrat, Donald Trump. Um, so, look, they've gone down uh, a, a really extreme road and we're in another posture. We're defending the institutions of democracy and we're making democracy work. And that's why today was such an extraordinary day with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. I extraordinary indeed. And that was the other big news from today. Tell us what this is going to mean for Americans when the president signs it into law. Oh, I mean, it's amazing. And uh, needless to say, it was done on a totally party line basis because no Republicans would come over to support it. But uh, let's start with this on climate change. We are reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 40 percent by the year 2030. So this is serious, sustained, dramatic investment in alternative renewable energies and financial incentives for us to break from uh, the 
carbon barons and the oil barons and moving to the kind of energy system that will make life sustainable for human beings on Earth. So that's a miraculous political breakthrough, given our 50-50 tie in the Senate and the fact that we just have six or seven vote margin over on the House side. Um, But we went way beyond that uh, because what we did was we have limited um, all Medicare beneficiaries to having to pay no more than $2,000 a year for their prescription drug costs. And there are people who are spending thousands and thousands of dollars a year. So we're saving people thousands of dollars. Specifically for all of my friends out there who have diabetes, we're limiting insulin costs to $35 a month. You cannot be forced to pay more than $35 a month. And in order to make all this happen, we are overturning the special interest rider that Republican Billy Towson had built into the Medicare Part D legislation when they said that the government could not negotiate with Big Pharma for lower prescription drug prices in the Medicare program the way that they could do it uh, in Medicaid or the VA. So we got rid of that. Now there will be a real free market in negotiations. We're going to see tens of billions of dollars uh, of savings. And we're going to, again, cap everybody's out-of-pocket prescription drug costs at $2,000 a year, which is just a magnificent breakthrough. And all of it is going to be paid for by uh, just making billionaire corporations pay a minimum tax so they can't get get away with paying zero a year, which so many of them have been doing for so long. You know, there's the benefit of the legislation itself. And I think there is the secondary effect of showing people that Washington can actually work and get things done and that government can be a, an engine for good. I do want to ask you again, big week, January 6th committee. Uh, the committee heard from several Trump administration cabinet members this week. What can you tell us about how forthcoming any of these officials are being? Just on your first point, I just want to underscore what you said. Um, the party of democracy, the Democratic Party, is showing not just that we're defending democracy, but we're making democracy work for the people over the worst possible obstructionism that we're seeing from the other side. But we have hung together. We've stayed uh, focused and we have delivered this most extraordinary legislation, the most important environmental legislation, certainly of this century, maybe in American history, uh, as well as breakthrough legislation on containing health care costs for the American people. But yes, we've had these uh, Um, you know, former Trump administration uh, cabinet officials come in to talk to them. I can't tell you any specifics about individual meetings, but I will say uh, as the member who introduced legislation on the 25th Amendment during um, the Trump administration, I'm very interested to know what exactly happened in terms of the reported, the publicly reported efforts by cabinet uh, officials to talk about invoking the 25th Amendment uh, to transfer power in those final weeks from Trump to Vice President Pence. And um, they, of course, couldn't get it together. And the president uh, was obviously able to use the fact that a lot of them were acting secretaries and his political influence over them to keep anything from happening. But it to me, emphasize the importance of legislation that I'd introduced to create a body under the 25th Amendment, um, because the 25th Amendment says that the vice president and a majority of the cabinet or the vice president and a majority of a body set up by Congress can determine that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of office. And so that's something we really have to look at, because Congress never set that body up uh, going all the way back to 1967 when the 25th Amendment was passed. We really have to look at that because Because, you know, if one member of Congress falls to the side for some reason, that's no big deal. We got 535 members. But if the president himself or herself is unable to meet the duties of office, that's a constitutional crisis. 